Hey, this is Jaron Johnson from the Cadillac 3, and listen to Walking the Floor. I'm walking the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senores and senoritas. This is Chris Shiplett, and you are listening to another fine edition of Walking the Floor, the best gosh darn podcast in all the world, or at least I say so. Where have I been, ladies and gentlemen? It's been weeks since I posted one of these episodes, and I was just sitting here getting ready to do this one, and so what the heck have I been doing? I don't know what I've been doing. It's just been really, really busy. It's that end of summer, into fall. The kids are back at school. We just got a new treadmill. There's just been a whole bunch of stuff going on that has kept me too busy to podcast. But I'll tell you what, boys and girls, I still have a gigantic uh, uh, collection of of unaired episodes and interviews that uh, that I have been um, stockpiling through this whole COVID time. I got more than I know what to do with, so it's gonna be uh, nothing but good times and interviews and podcasts moving forward for months and years and and perhaps even decades. We'll see, we'll see. It's podcast mania over here. All right, let's pay some bills with our good friend Zounds.com. You know Zounds.com, you love Zounds.com. It's where you get all your instruments and whatnot. Did uh, you know, though, that they have warehouses strategically located all over the United States to get you your gear faster than anyone else? And over 90% of Zounds orders arrive within two days or less, and it's free shipping on every order. So get on over there to Zounds.com and get yourself some gear. Ladies and gentlemen, you deserve it. Let's get to today's interview. Well, it's hard. Okay, so today's interview is with my good buddy, uh, Mr. Jaron Johnston, lead singer, guitar player from the Cadillac 3, great little rock and roll outfit out of Nashville, Tennessee. And you know, I think him and all of his bandmates are actual Nashville natives, which is unusual. And you might not know, but Jaron is also a hit songwriter, man. He writes big hits for big country artist man like all the time and i've had the pleasure recently of writing a couple tunes with him and uh he's good he's good at it and we talk a lot about songwriting craft and and uh, tricks of the trade and all that sort of thing so all you young songwriters out there listen up he spills the beans on the goods on how to do it and i should take a moment to apologize to jaron because somehow i didn't record the first few minutes of this here interview and Missed him talking a bunch of cool stuff about Cadillac 3 and whatnot, and um, I don't know how. I'm I'm a Luddite. They really should make you, like, have to pass a test and get a license to run a podcast, but they don't, and that's why I'm doing it. All right, this is Jaron Johnson from the Cadillac 3 on Walking the Floor. It's going to be very cool. I think that a lot of, like on the last record, the Country Fuzz record, a couple of those songs were older. They just never got recorded because they didn't fit the record at the time, you know? And then sometimes you'll write this smash song that you think is great that Luke Bryan or somebody's going to record, and they never do, so you don't record it. But then you come back around to it and say, well, that song was great, let's do it, you know? And so that ends up on our record. So, um, yeah, it's different every record, you know? Who knows? I was thinking about, like, looking, just looking at the track listings on on the Cadillac 3 records, and, and we're in this era where the like the the record or the long playing record is almost like a a thing of the past you know it's becoming more and more of a relic and you guys put out long records you know like 11 songs 14 songs 16 songs i mean 16 songs your last album was like 16 tracks that's like a yeah by modern standards that's like a double record easy you right. know what i mean like um how do you what like why do you have you made that choice and how do you persuade your label to go <laughs> to go along with it uh, I mean, the label thing, they're just, they're great. They let us kind of do what we want over there just because they, I think Scott Bichetta sees that we're kind of doing something in the genre that nobody's doing. And he doesn't want to 
slow that down, slow that creativity down, slow that coolness down. And I think more than more than anything, I think he knows that we have a real uh, fan base that can go out and when you can play, can do this and do it for real. And I think the reason that our fans are so involved is because we do give them so much content. There's so many songs. You know, I was like, and I, I'm so, you know, a lot of people, the EP thing, I just, uh, coming up, I've been doing this a long time, and I always thought EP thing was something the label told you because you didn't have enough songs for a record. And I'm like, fuck that, man. <laughs> you know, like, I, that's the last boat I want to be floating in, man. So I think that, you know, I, I'm in love with the old school mentality of even if it's just a nine song record, I want it to be a record, you know, and I want to call it a record just for myself. Yeah. I mean, Damn the Torpedoes had nine songs on it, I think. And, you know, I, that's one of my favorite records of all time. Then you look at bands like the Chili Peppers, you know, or Miranda Lambert, who put out 22 song records. Let's just do a double record, you know, like, right, right. which for a lot of people, that's, it's too much content. But yeah. I think, you, you find a sweet spot right there in the middle, 15, 16 songs. Right. You know, it's pretty, pretty cool. I, I think that's kind of, we're just in love with that old school mentality, like you were saying, that, you know, I want to, I'm going to print vinyl every time. I'm going to, you know, you, it'd be tough to print an EP on vinyl. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it's not right. worth it. Yeah, it's funny. I forget who I interviewed a while ago said something along the lines of like, people nowadays will sit and binge through five seasons of some show on Netflix, but they can't make it through a whole record. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's funny that way, like the, the, the way our attention spans have developed. I would think right now, and I don't know, but you know, because I, I don't pay super close attention to all the streaming numbers, but I, I would think people's streaming numbers would be way up just because, you know, so many people are sort of in, you know, locked down and, and need something, need content and entertainment. But I, but I wonder if it's you working think that, that. Yeah. you think that, but if you think also like probably not too many people are driving around. Some people ain't even driving to work. I think most people listen to music in their cars. Right. right. Um, maybe more people on the other side are working out more and listening to workout mixes, you know, right. so maybe that drives it a little bit, but I don't know. Um, it's such a weird thing about, streaming and how to even you know because you definitely can't base it on a, off of a monetary situation you can't you can oh well, it looks like the streams are up this way i got three more dollars you see that money <laughs> it's exciting so yeah. you know yeah. it's really weird it's weird times man you know it's yeah i don't know yeah yeah that's a, that's i interviewed that uh the singer for old crow medicine show catch recently and, and he yeah. said something along those lines like now that you don't have touring like there literally is no money in music anymore it's just pure art <laughs> yeah, and, and it's and it's all about being creative. I was, um, we were working up something, and we were gonna do this cool thing or whatever, like video or whatever. And then I saw Keith Urban do the thing where he had there's a video of him in his studio basement, and he's playing every instrument, hmm. and it goes to him doing this, it was him doing this, goes to him doing this, and it's back and forth. And it looks like a band, but then they put them all in the same shot. Yeah. And I was like, mind blown. And I was like, well, we should stop right now and go back to the trying board because nobody's going to give a shit about what we're doing when he's doing this kind of stuff, you know? So yeah, yeah got to be creative. Yeah. Tough time to hold people's attention. Um, yeah. Tell me about like growing up, uh, you guys all grew up in Nashville together, right? Aren't you all like, yeah. high school or childhood friends? Yeah. Kelby and I went to Hume Fog right downtown uh, and Neil went to Hillsborough, which is right down the street. Can you give me like the condensed sort of this is your life, you know, history, you know, wh where exactly you grew up, like what it was like, what got yeah. you into music, what was the scene like around you when you were coming up? Uh, I grew up in Inglewood, which is East Nashville, which is now kind of like the hip place to live. And when I was there, it was um, not so hip. It was a little, a little sketchy, you know, uh, definitely got, got into a bunch of fights growing up. My jacket my starter jacket and my, my Jordan's taken from me, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, dad was a drummer at the Grand Ole Opry. Oh, really? With, yeah. He played with a bunch of people, um, still plays a little bit. Um, so I kind of, from an early age was very into drums and that was my main instrument for until I was probably 22 years old. Uh, so I got into it that way. And dad also as a side hustle, he was a song plugger down on music row. And so he pitched songs for, this guy named Estel Howard's catalog, which is John Michael Montgomery and some people like that. And so I got, got to kind of see how excited he was. He'd come home and be like, hey, guys, we're eating spaghetti tonight. Daddy got a hold, which means 
you got to hold some one of the country stars. Hey, I like that song. Let's hold it. Don't let anybody else record it. Mm. And so I got to see that kind of thing firsthand as well as being into the drums and high school band and all that stuff that you do. And I started writing songs, you know, probably was taking it serious, probably like 23, 24 years old and got sick of playing drums for people that I saw weren't as good songwriters, but also were just making bad decisions. And so I kind of took it in my own hands, jumped into doing that. And Kelby and Neil's bands had both broken up and it just kind of happened. You know, we started playing, you know, 2004, 2005, something like that. Got a record deal, got a publishing deal. Boom. How, I mean, how have you guys managed to keep it together? I always think of, you know, a lot of the guys that I played with growing up, I'm still friends with and stuff, but um, I, like, I, I feel like it would be harder to keep a band together with, with guys that you've known from, from being so young because sort of the, the realities of the music industry bump up against what you imagine it to be. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, how, how have you guys managed to keep together as you've all, you know, matured and evolved and become adults? I, you know, honestly, it's, it's been really easy for some reason. Maybe it's just the three different personalities of me and Kelby and Neil. Um, we had another member in, in our original band, American Bang, and we were on Warner Brothers. And that, you know, he's still one of our best friends. But I think once he wasn't in the picture, uh, 2010, he left. That was kind of a little bit of a toxic relationship for all of us, I think. And so we all kind of... I don't know, ever since 2011 when we started the Cadillac thing, it's, it's just been easy. I, you know, you, you, you know somebody so well, you live with them 20 years, you know. You, you kind of know when to hit them and when not to hit them, when to back off, when to, you know, when Kel I know when Kelby's hungry. All right, we need to feed him, then we'll have a conversation. <laughs> you know, that, like that kind of stuff. When he's hangry. They, yeah, and they, you know, they know when I've had too much and they shouldn't listen to me. To, I've had too much to drink or whatever, you know. And they also know, I think, everybody kind of knows their role in the band. I think that's pretty important. Um, and it, so it's kind of all evened out. Like the, none of the weight is too heavy on anybody. Right. right. Um, so I think that helps a lot. And I mean, it, it also just comes down to extreme real brotherhood and friendship and a damn dream of watching the Tom Petty document documentary over and over and over again and wanting to do that, you know, like right, right. that that's kind of, I think that's kind of what ties us together. And, I think the three of us also know that we ain't going to go out and start another band. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't want, you know, how exhausting that it's would too be. Too late to, to break up. Name. Yeah. 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 So it's, <laughs> it's, it is fun, man. We love playing. We play good together. So I think that's, it's all those things together. Why did you settle on that specific instrumentation? Like why not have a, a full-time bass player? Like I imagine, was, you know, you put bass on your records or whatever, but live, you, you know, with the drums, guitar yeah. and, and steel. I mean, for the most part, it was just lack of having somebody that was as close to us as the three of us were, you know what I mean? So you wouldn't want to bring in, you know, which is Nashville because that's what they do all the time. It's like, oh, I just need a bass player. Call up Joe, whoever, you know, he'll, he'll play. But it's like we also needed somebody that was, you know, needed that, that friendship, loyalty needed to be there, the history needed to be there, and the fact that we, on the drop of a dime, like the three of us, we got a show tomorrow with ZZ Top, but it's in Maine. We got to leave now. You know, so we can pick up and go with the three of us. And um, we didn't really, our first show was with ZZ Top in Nashville. And we didn't know how we were going to do it. So I said, screw it. I'll just play with a bassman, uh, Tweed. Actually, it's right here. That guy right there. No, and turned not. it up, turned the bass all the way up, all across the thing, treble all the way down, uh, running as heavy as I could on 11. That's a loud amp, as you know. And Kelby played lap steel, big amp, amp, the uh, all the bass knobs turned up the same way and drums and Billy came up after the show and he goes, man, don't change a thing. Um, and then I said, actually, you know, we've been in the studio with Dave Cobb a little bit and he's got this frequency divider idea, this pitch shifter thing that we might be able to send the channel through Kelby's thing to run bass through that. And he goes, actually do that. That sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did that. We did that. And sure enough, that next summer we toured with top and, um, he comes up the first day and he goes, you figure it out. And we showed it to him. And so he said, okay, so I want to take that idea and do the opposite. So he wanted to run uh, Dusty's bass through a frequency divider and do the top end too. So they, you know? they didn't need a second guitar player? 
I guess so. <laughs> I, guess so. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what I like the most about that story, the, the way you worked that out or the fact that Billy Gibbons at the – at the length of time that ZZ Top has still been together, that he's still thinking about like how oh, to fill man. some void, some sonic void in the in their sound. That's hilarious. It, that guy's stories, man. You know, it, you know, it, to have that fire still as old as he is, like that. You know, just he wants to be so creative, and he's con- like he'll pull you into his dressing room. They like Jen, Jen, come in here, and you walk in there like, oh, I don't know how long. I, I mean, it's awesome because it's Billy, and he's a sweetheart, but you don't know how long you're going to be in there and <laughs> there's smoothie machines everywhere. There's a sleeping bag on the floor where he naps. One of the richest guys I know sleeps on the floor during the day. Um, and it'll always give you something, whether it's a pocket knife or a cocaine vial full of chili peppers that's been uh, grounded up. And he says, Hey, Jaron, you sprinkle a little bit of this on some chocolate ice cream. Things get really <laughs> weird. <laughs> True story. I still have really? it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Epic. You you mentioned uh, recording with Dave Cobb. Did he did he produce your guys' first record? He did some of the first record. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, we went in and cut with him at the very beginning, and uh, it was actually that studio is right across the street from Red Door in Nashville. And it's not there anymore. I think it was like Butch Walker and somebody's place. They were splitting it, but we went in there, and I mean, he just it was great. You know, we just cut eleven live songs pretty much. And then it was, honestly, looking back on it, I wish I probably would have kept a lot of that, but I just thought it was too far in the rock world and I needed something to, I needed a country anchor a little bit more. And so mm. we went back in and cut a lot of it. We kept two, two songs on that record because I couldn't beat the kick drum sound. <laughs> well, like, where do you think, you, where do you see yourself, the band sitting genre-wise? Um, I, you know, I think that's what's cool about it. And I, I, actually, this next record, I really don't know where it's going to go that way but um if you listen to all our lyrics and the melodies it's extremely accessible and extremely friendly to the country listeners ear um our music back- background kind of you know leans really heavy on rage and food nirvana you know stuff like that um a lot of funk things a lot of uh, a lot of just you know grunge for lack of a better thing and so i, I like to think you can't really put us in a genre i mean hell that's the reason we called the last record country fuzz just so we could stop getting that question and no offense to you but uh, <laughs> but but we could have some something to give people and be like well what is it well it's country fuzz you know it's country songwriting with fuzzy guitars all over it you know, well, it's, uh, you know? it's it's interesting because you know I, a lot of people refer to you guys as southern rock or whatever and i tend to think of you as being somewhere between them both or whatever but but in listening to you know your records like and especially in context of sort of modern day country music where there's plenty of crunchy guitars you know what i mean there's right, totally. a lot of rock you know rock southern rock and rock and roll and country music have all fused you know um it, it is interesting i just didn't know i w- i guess part of what i'm asking is where do you get sort of support in, you know in the industry do you, like do you get airplay on country radio or where does the we world did. see you at the top of the thing, right when we signed with Big Machine, the, that song the South did really well and kind of put us on the map there. That being said, it had Florida Georgia Line and Dirks Bentley on it, so that probably helped that out a lot coming out of the gates. Um, I think, you know, for me to sit here and say that country radio is going to ever fully embrace us would be pretty out there. You know, I think um, I think a band like us has to get so big that country music can't not play us. You know, like, I think, you know, that's a hard sell for me right now, just knowing the genre so where, well and where it's at and kind of where it's leading. If you look at, you know, the highway, the Sirius XM station, whatever, it's, it leans more towards like an AC songwriter um, kind of format. You know what I mean? So there's no really room for us there, whereas we used to get played on that, but it changed. Mm. Uh, and then you're looking at pretty much playlist on Spotify's and Pandora's and stuff like that. So... Then we kind of win because it's we can fit in the uh, country rocks one. We can fit in the southern rock one. We can fit in the rock one. We can fit in what you know some heavier wild country and stuff like that. Um, right. So as far as where we sit, I think we sit in our own little chair that you know is a neat place to be because it's not like I finally got to the point too where I'm not sitting here trying to write 
our records for country radio because I think that really hurts a band like us, you know, when you're trying to go somewhere, go, go somewhere that nobody's been, you know, is that, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, no, I mean, that's interesting considering that you write these, you know, songs that get cut by big country artists, you know, that you sort of have that distinction. I'm, yeah. I'm curious from like a country radio point of view, where, what, what are the sort of, indicators or where is that line where something well no that's a little too rock or no that's that's country you know like where how do they define the difference um is it like is it instrumentation is it lyrical is it you know the production like where, where all of the above i think like, it's all it? it's right. definitely all of the above i think a lot of it probably has to do with with my voice is you know like so eric church is an example he has that tenor real country straight up voice right but he has these heavy down tuned guitars and it works that being said eric got so big country music country radio could not could not not play him so uh, you know i i don't know it's it's weird it's it's a conundrum um for me like i do see i think that's why i try so hard to write these hits for other people is because I get to flex both those muscles and I get to be this guy over here who doesn't give a shit and write the music that he wants to write and play the music that he wants to play. But then also I get to kind of be creative and be Tim McGraw for three and a half minutes, you know, or whatever in the other side. Um, Cause I, I mean, I, I really wish and I hope, and I'm not saying they won't ever, but I hope that country music, I like to think that they would, um, take hold of a band like us. He's all born and raised in Nashville. And, you know, I'm steeped in old country, man. I love, you know, it's in my, I got Nashville tattooed on my damn arm, man. You right. know, <laughs> right. so, you know, my babysitter growing up was the Grand Ole Opry because I would go with my dad every Friday and Saturday night and Tuesdays sometimes. Um, <laughs> so it'd be neat to see that. But, you know, like I said, I'm not holding my breath on that just because I'm not going to start writing, you know, for that. Cause I think it'll change our records. And I think that might be a deterrent to where we want to go. I mean, are, are there sort of like when you're writing to try to get a cut, are there certain guidelines that, that, that you keep in mind as, as you're going? I, I was thinking about it like after we were working on that tune the other day, there was, uh, I forget where we were in the song, and, and at one point I think you said something like, oh, we need to toughen that part up. You know, like yeah. we need to toughen that line up or some, something along those lines. And it just kind of struck me. I was like, huh, like are there sort of, are you sort of, like is it in the back of your mind what some you know a Keith Urban or somebody like that is going to be comfortable singing while you're writing yeah I always say it, there is a lot of that but I always say you try to write the best song first you know like get it to where it's so it's just a great song it's cool this is cool and then you look at things and you're like and think about the pitches next you know like think about who where you're going to go next because like you know dirks would probably never say that you know or um it was a lot of times it's a conversation like dirks would never say that but keith would keith would go there you know or that's too funky hey but keith would go there or you know it's a song about a beach or whatever the the play there is jake owen or kenny so sometimes you start writing it directly for jake or kenny so it changes it's different every time but um I mean, I do it every day, and like you saw that day, I could see your mind on some when we were going. You were like, "So this is what this is what these assholes do." <laughs> 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 and, yeah. and, and it was it was fun to watch that too because it, it's neat. Um, no, you know, you, you know what you know what blew me away in that and in, in that thing that you did that I've never seen anybody else do was actually start demoing the song in real time. Yeah, which is such a it was. That was amazing. Like I, I've I've heard that there in in a lot of like writing sessions there'll be a guy that's like a track guy or something. And I'm right. not saying that that's what what you were doing exactly. But like, um, but the you know there's such a difference between a few people sitting there with acoustic guitars trying to you know come up with lines or whatever, and then actually hearing those ideas with a drum Tons beat and some life to it. You know what I mean? It like it. It had an, like I thought that had like a huge impact on 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 that song and sort of that moment what we were doing. I've just never seen it before. Is that well, is that can hear, is that a normal can, thing in in songwriting yeah. sessions? Oh yeah, and a lot not as much on Zoom. The Zoom writes it's kind of hard. It gets sometimes it kind of messes things up. 
normally I do it just a to kind of get the vibe going, but B for time's time sake, just because when we get off the Zoom, I probably got three or four hours of work to get that thing done, and I'm trying to get the family and all that stuff. But um, we, you know, a lot of the guys, and it depends on who I'm writing with or girls, like, it's just still a lot of the, you know, sitting there with an acoustic guitar and, well, this is cool. You know, then that, if I do it that way, man, that means I got to have the phone recording the whole time or whatever, and then I have to take that into my room and then listen back and figure out where I was. If I'm doing it in real time, I can at least get the original idea like it was. And a lot of times you're not going to beat that first take either. You know? And it helps right. the song sometimes too. Yeah. Cause I feel like a lot of time when I go back and listen back on my phone to like an idea I had at midnight on a Tuesday or something six months ago, I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck I was thinking. Delete. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's not good at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, but there's some magic to it in that moment. If you just like chased it down, maybe you would have had something. I, dude, I was writing with Dallas Davidson the other day. He's, I don't know if you know who he is, but he, you know, he's a super successful songwriter and cool guy, old buddy of mine. And he, he gets on Zoom and it's me, him, and it's supposed to be me, him, and Darius Rucker. And Darius cancels because he's playing golf. And so he gets Luke Bryan. And Luke Bryan never shows up for the Zoom. He just sends us an idea. <laughs> and so <laughs> Dallas says, well, I got this idea that, um, that might go with this. And so he sends me this thing from his phone. It's him at three o'clock in the morning. He's whispering his phone and he goes, see if you can make something like that. And he goes, does Emma, that's just drawing a bang. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing. And so I'm just going like, yeah, I think we, I could get something out of that, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and did you, did you get it done? We got, we got it. We got it. Oh, nice. One, but, nice. Yeah. I mean, who, who are some of like the, um, I'm curious on a couple of things. A, what was, what was your first big cut that sort of got you, um, that got you into the, the music row world? Um, my first big like hit thing, the, the big one was called You're Gonna Fly and it was a Keith Urban hit. It's actually, I think my only two week number one that I've ever had, but he, he did that one and he took it from another country artist or whatever the publishers gave it to him and, it was weird because it's like as soon as the the publishers around and uh, other writers and stuff had heard that because at that time it was kind of hard to get Keith Urban cut and as soon as they'd heard that he'd cut one of my songs it was like the next day my publisher the girl that was doing my books she had little to no problem getting me in any room to write you know what I mean so it was like I can remember that. I can remember doors starting opening up when I was getting cuts, but that song in particular, I can remember that really opened up a lot of doors. Like, did you feel a pressure attached to that? Like, I've had to say, I got to fucking bring the goods, or were you just up for it? I don't, yeah, I've always, I like, I, you know what I mean? I like that kind of pressure. And it's, it's yeah. just, it's like you, it's, it's like being in a band. It's like, you know, I, I like the feeling before the show. I, you know what I mean? I like right, that. Right, right, I like those the, butterflies. The, the, but yeah, the butterflies. Indeed. Yeah, so I, I think I love that kind of pressure, and um, I'll tell you the, the one of the first cuts I ever got was a meatloaf cut, believe it or not. Really? Yeah, it was on a record called "Hang Cool Teddy Bear," and it was at that moment when I heard the record title, I was like, "Well, this, this record's probably not going to do much." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I got a cut. I, Goddamn! Yeah, yeah, I met him in an ele elevator at Sony ATV in Nashville, and um, he said, "Hey, I heard a couple of your songs. I like them." I was like, "Cool, man." Uh, and the whole time you're just thinking about the character in Fight Club, you know, the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was that didn't help my career at all, really. <laughs> but was was Meatloaf trying to make a country record or something? Was this a, well? It a was leaning comeback? a little that way. Right. It was leaning that way, and then it went to this opera thing. Like he kind of tends to. Yeah, to. yeah, yeah. I mean, who are some of the folks that maybe like the public at large wouldn't know their name? That maybe you know, mentored you or helped, you know, took you under their wing or whatever when you were first coming into the songwriting world? Uh, Bonnie Baker was a, she kind of helped me learn how to really format a country song and to still think out of the box. Steve Bogard. I mean, the first day I wrote with Steve Bogard, I walked in, I just signed with Famous Publishing and I walked in there and he like, I gave him an idea and I started kind of playing. He goes, cool. And I watched him kind of math it out and, and I, and I was like, oh, so it's, okay, I see. And then I saw a couple of other people do that. And that's like learning that 
that one trick helped me out a lot. And then Wait, Tony Lane. Dig, dig into that a but, little bit because you said to how to map out a country song but still think out of the box. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, that was Bonnie because her lyrics were always out of the box. Steve's not out of the box as much. Steve's right down the middle. But it's basically just saying – because all my ideas up to that point were like, you know, leaning like in a John Mayer thing or like Dave Matthews Band or somewhere that was just kind of like cool parts, but they didn't all really go together necessarily. And they didn't fit a format that somebody, Joe Schmo, country radio listener, could hear and be like, oh, yeah, roll the window down. Here comes the chorus. You know, here comes right. the verse. I know this next, I know where it's going. But doing that in a cool way, like your own spin on it, it was neat to have all those kind of different kind of writers like tom douglas is another one I don't know. you know tom i don't think so oh uh, you should talk to tom at some point he's he's brilliant he's one of my best friends but he 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 also shared like he wrote house that built me by miranda mm. um bunch of great songs but he also taught me that you can you can write springsteen you know what i mean you can write that style of music or the lyrically and do this and i think that that was an eye opener too, because just seeing real thoughts, and I'd heard that growing up, listening to '90s country, because there was a lot of that. You know, if you listen to "Live Like You're Dying," you're like, "Oh my God, that's brilliant!" You know, that's a great song. Um, but it fits that format. You know, it mm. fits this thing. Um, and then throwing little left curves every now and then, where you lose Joe Schmo for a minute, the radio listener, but you get his girl. You get the girl. She's like, "Oh, I love that part." You know what I mean? Like. I, that's, that's some of the cool tricks that I remember. Like with, with, when you say tricks like in formatting, do you mean like callbacks and things like that? Like what, what sort of specific stuff? Like um, a post. Okay, so Southern Girl, Tim McGraw song. It's my second number one, I think. And it has a post that you think the chorus, and the chorus is really long, but the hook of the song is not the chorus. The hook of the song is really the post. Southern girl, rock my world, hazel eyes and golden curl, but a little country song. You get the girl there. The guy gets, you get the guy in the chorus. Mm. And it's just little tricks like that that, I don't know, make it, you could try to go where every other songwriter on the road, because there's probably a thousand people down there at the same time trying to write the same four chords, you know. Right. How do you do that differently? And stand out in a pitch meeting you know or how does how do you you got to put i put i always try to put something in our songs that makes you know the the, the listener be like oh that's cool well they, they okay good i'm glad they did that otherwise it'd just be every other fucking song you know i don't know, I don't know if that answered your question or not yeah no that's great that's great i love getting into the nitty-gritty of it um you know during this sort of like hyper partisan political world that we're living in right now. I've noticed that you, you guys have posted some stuff like uh, supporting Black Lives Matter and NAACP and like pictures of you guys wearing face masks and stuff that are, that are I imagine, like polarizing to a lot of people out there. And I even went back and looked at some of those posts to see what the comments were. Because I was just wondering if that it's put you, if, like if, if that puts you at odds with, you know, parts of your fan base. Uh, you know, and I say, I say that as somebody who is constantly berated on social media by parts of our fan base, you know, right. various things that I, that I post, you know, I, you know, it's the, it, it's so frustrating because, you know, believe what you want to believe. You know, I, I personally am, you know, I sit in a place where I feel like it's a pretty rational mindset of like, you know, obviously things aren't great right now. And so. I should probably use my flat or my platform to at least say something, you know, if I want to, because that's my right as an American citizen. And so when I post anything, I, I, I tried to not do that for such a long time, just because I knew the the backlash that the band would get, the brand would get, my family would get. Um, and those are issues that are hard to deal with sometimes, but I, you know, it's like, it, for people getting upset with something that I say is like, it's, it's, it's just my opinion, man. You know, like you you, you post what you want to post. And if you don't like me, or if you don't like the fact that we're going to give proceeds all, you know, to the NAACP for this week's merch sales, don't buy a shirt. You know, you don't have to get, get your panties in a wad or your undies in a, in a mess over, over this thing. And if you do really just 
don't follow me, man. You know, like, I don't care. Like, that's, that's the mindset I'm kind of taking now just because it's, I, do I really need that asshole at my show anyways if we get to play again? You know, it's, it's so, I mean, I think we lost, we lost, like, a couple fans or whatever, or followers. I think I lost, like, 400 followers. I was like, oh, well, I weeded them out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, it's weird times right now to not say something felt a little weird and not do something felt a little weird. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough, man. I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, our, we make music to try to give people a, a, re, a release and a let go from the world's problems. Like I'm not sitting here trying to be rage against the machine or anything, you know, like right, I don't right. think I could do that if I wanted to because I'm not, well enough informed I, I don't you know i don't know i just know what i feel and times feel really fucked up right now so we did that just to try to do a little thing to help i don't see why that was so weird to people but well whatever. it's it's interesting you know like I'm, I'm curious how some of that affects your songwriting because um you know with songs like like there is a sort of like a lyrically defiant tone to to some of the songs that you write like like i'm southern or this accent or the south and i you know for people like we live in this giant country, you know, where there's all these different cultural flavors kind of all over the place. And when you think of how, just how enormous a landmass is, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a beautiful thing that there's all these different cultures all over, but there is no doubt, like there are these sort of stereotypes attached to a North South divide, a rural urban divide, a coastal versus Midwest uh, divide. And, and I'm wondering like how, the uh the sort of tension in a lot of like cultural and political the like the times that we're in like how that works its way into the songs that you write how do you think that that influences it it's it's interesting um i mean i, I say that right something now, like like i don't pretend to have like a like a, a a deep understanding of say southern culture so i didn't grow up there you know what i mean i'm from a different right. place so i'm i'm curious because when i read some of the lyrics like you know it's this like it's a it's a sense of pride of place or whatever but i'm yeah. but but it's not something that i fully understand you know what i mean i mean i i don't understand why we're so big in europe you know like the UK, I have no, I have no, I mean, and those are the questions that we get when we go there for interviews. It's like, so, so what is the South? What is the South? You know, and you're like, you have to explain, well, you know, it, so I usually say it's, it's, you know, it's just the way I grew up. It's a slower way of living. Uh, my family's all rooted and they all live in Louisiana and that's a mm. different life down there. And my parents moved here pregnant with me um, and I was born here in Nashville. And so, I grew up, you know, you know, buried in, in country music, like country music. And also, you know, my parents being as Southern as they were, obviously that's going to be all, all over me. Um, it's, it's hard to explain. I don't know. I just write that first record and that second record is all pretty much just me writing songs about that. I thought would be fun to sing. Like my daddy came from Louisiana, like the hot sauce or, you know, and it's all this, a lot of this is, it's this good old boy mentality of like, like all my cousins and friends growing up, you know, it's keep, you know, keep your city lights, just give us the sticks. You know, like it's, it was more of a character than, than, you know, kind of a, a, an actual thing. Cause I, I didn't actually grow up super country. I just saw a lot of that because my parents did and right. all my family was down there. Uh, I will say right now, writing songs these days, Pretty much, if not every day, every other day, one of the writers tries to write a song that is very relative to these times, which is sometimes if you got the right guys and girls in the room, um, awesome. Sometimes it's not because it's hard. It's very hard. And uh, I've written a couple that are really good and I'm proud of, but at the same time, it's like, am I going to want to listen to this? a year from now or six months from now, God forbid we get out of this. Like, I don't want, I don't know if it'll, I want, I want to be remembered or I, if I want to remember this weird <laughs> right. time for our, for our country, you know? And, yeah. and the last thing you want to do too is write something that's really going to just, unless it's brilliant, that's really just going to piss people off and just cause, you know, like, I, I think I it's, so, I, it's, those are the hardest songs to write, man. Anything about oh, man. like current events or politics, it's so hard to avoid being either 
vague to the point of like, what the fuck's the point? You know, what are we doing? Right. Or preachy. You know, it's like yeah. finding some finding that middle ground that's like somehow poignant. <laughs> it's, it's really that's, a, that's another rule that I try to stick to too, man. When we're writing songs, is to try not to get too preachy because the last thing I want to listen to when I'm listening to some of my favorite artists is somebody telling me I should live like this, you know, or I should right. do this because it also kind of goes back against what I just said. If I'm sitting there writing songs telling people they should think this way. It's their right to think that way. Even, I don't, even if I don't agree with it, I, you know, I don't want to be that guy. You know, I want to be the guy that's like, hell yeah, we'll all get through this together. You know, you, you know what I mean? Like yeah, if, yeah. if I'm going to write that song, it's yeah. a we are the world. It's a we are the world. It's not fuck you, you know, put this in your country song. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, it's. Oh, I think it's that actually funny, that's man. an Eric Church song. I think that he just put out, it's called, <laughs> Eric, I'm just, I, I did not mean to you. So <laughs> I'll edit that part out. Uh, we yeah. don't want to piss him off. Uh, it, it's just funny. You know, I think about that a lot sometimes. There's sort of like if you were to watch MSNBC or Fox News or whatever, you get, a, you know, all these certain stereotypes and you'd think we're all just at war with each other. But as somebody who has traveled this country for decades, you know, touring and, and been all over the place as well as like a lot of the rest of the world, like I don't find myself walking around in constant conflict with people over the subtleties in our worldviews, you know what I mean? I just don't think it's, yeah. I think, I, I'm not going to say that there aren't differences, you know, with, with people's beliefs or whatever, but like, I don't, I think the reality out on the street is, is not nearly as, um, as tense as it's, as, as it's made to appear. And that's, and that's news for, you know, that's the TV. And I will say it, you know, it, it wasn't always, I don't want to get too deep into this, but it's like, it wasn't always like this. Like you didn't have to like, like say you say I vote this way and my best friend or my dad or whoever voted this way, it didn't, back then it was like, okay, cool. You know, whatever. I yeah. get it. That's your you right. Didn't, you That's didn't like, have to hate the motherfuckers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And now it's like <laughs> dividing families and it's, it's really a bizarre thing, man. So yeah. I don't uh, know. Uh, strange times. Um, enough about that. I, I heard a, uh, a rumor about a side project you're starting. What's, What's that? A side project. Is that true? You think I got? You think I got time to do a side <laughs> well, that, project? That, that's what I was gonna ask. I saw somebody. I I posted something. I don't remember where it was. See here, I go reading fake news on the internet again. Um, oh. I saw. I posted something about you, maybe when you were on, came onto my live stream or something, and somebody said, "You better get him on walking the floor quick before he starts recording his new side project with so and so." I was like, oh. uh, well. I mean, I'm doing a couple of things, but like there was a joke, not a joke going around, but I had some buddies that a couple of LA guys and a Nashville dude that we were going to start a Fugazi cover band, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that could be what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Probably yeah. not. I was going to play drums in it though. I'm excited. Oh, That'd killer. Wow. Nice. A return to the skins. Yeah, I do. That would, that would be tough. Like I could yeah. probably handle the Fugazi stuff maybe, but. I don't know, man. That'd be tough. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, you got time to get your chops together, buddy. Nothing but time these days. No kidding. Well, that's all I got, my man. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, it's great to see you, man. You too. Let's write Let's another write tune here soon. Hell yeah. I'll, I'll hit you in the next couple of days with a date or two. Okay, cool. Awesome. See you. See you, buddy. All right, that was Jaron Johnston from the Cadillac 3 on Walking the Floor. Make sure you get on over to walkinthefloor.com and check out all the links referencing all the cool stuff that we talked about in this interview. Or you could just Google it yourself. Whatever floats your boat. Uh, that's it for this week. We'll be back soon. Remember, kids, fight the good fight and stick it to the man. This is Chris Shiflett. Adios, amigos! Adios, amigos!